My uh, thanks to the um, to the uh, organizers for inviting me here. Um, in addition to just generally being happy to be in a group uh, like this, I also have, uh, through my work at EMBO, connections with ICGB and the JRC. I'll tell you about EMBO in a moment, and you'll see, I think, the relationships uh, from the discussions yesterday during the introduction about what those two um, organizing um, groups have done. Um, I want to spend a minute just telling you about EMBO because it's a somewhat unusual organization. We have aspects of many different kinds of organizations and we try to integrate these in our work. So we are um, foremost an elected membership organization. So this consists of um, mostly European scientists but others as well who are elected by their peers. So we have an aspect of an academy. Um, we give fellowships, so as ICGB does in that we discussed um, for postdoctoral researchers. That is our single largest program uh, by funding. Um, extremely important to us. We support young investigators, so new principal investigators at other institutions, um, helping them form networks and be collaborative and be mobile, which is very important to us from our original remit. Um, we fund courses and workshops much like these. Um, we have a science policy program, which I head. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, we also have a scientific publishing unit um, that is self-sufficient. I want to point that out because, um, importantly, EMBO as a whole, minus the, the publishing, is funded by the European Molecular Biology Conference. This is a group of member states that, again, provides our funding. It is more or less the same as the EU nations. We gain a few, we lose a few. We also have partnerships with countries including uh, India and Singapore, and as well partnership agreements with Chile and Taiwan. So we are not universal, but we are sort of Europe and for the moment a little bit beyond. The scientific, science policy program was established about eight years ago. Um, EMBO itself is about 50 years old, so um, prior to this there had been a lot of policy work, but it had not been integrated into a program. The three areas we care about are biotechnology, which is what I will talk about today. Again, policy issues around scientific publishing and transparency, and as well, responsible conduct of research and research assessment. I will not talk about these two latter points directly, but I think in the discussion they become relevant. It turns out there's enormous amounts of overlaps in terms of policy between these areas. Um, I wanna go to a, um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, origin of this quote is frequently lost to history, but in fact it comes from somebody who worked in administrative policy in the uh, late 1940s, early 1950s in the United States. It's called Miles Law. Where you stand depends upon where you sit. This is very important to us. So where I sit generally is at the campus of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. You heard about this yesterday with respect to the mouse consortium. Um, EMBL has satellite laboratories, including the one in Monte Rotondo. This is the link to the mouse side. This is the mothership. So this is the headquarters in Heidelberg. It is where the EMBL director sits. These are the laboratories. Um, many of you have perhaps um, visited already to attend courses in the Advanced Training Center. Um, for those of you who have visited here in Heidelberg, Germany, um, the famous Altstadt, um, the beautiful bridge and the castle is sort of down here. We're up on a hill. Um, it's very, it has a, a retreat-like atmosphere to it. Um, I use this as an opportunity to invite you to visit should you ever be in the area. Um, EMBO, uh, the European Molecular Biology Organization, where I work, is this small building right here. Uh, we have about 50 people, about half of them are in publishing. Um, the other half work in the programs as I do. Where I literally sit is just on the other side of the point of this building. I look into a layer of laboratories where I see researchers, like all of us here. Um, as has been pointed out a few times now, we do this work because we are excited about it. People love science. Researchers love to research. I am reminded of this when I can look in and see people working. 
you know, sometimes there's a little sadness or you can see there's a little frustration, but, but basically people are excited. I work for an organization. I care about the organization as a stakeholder. I work as a policy analyst, so I care about stakeholders more broadly, but I care about researchers. This is where I'm coming from. So just to put that out as a statement of, of my, um, my focus or bias, depending on your point of view of that. So I think about governance a lot. This is what we do. So governance, not government. We talked about this earlier yesterday as well. Um, government laws, this is part of governance, but we're looking at something more broad. So we think about processes that lead to laws, about policy and politics. So I, I want to make this point here that we think about policy as expanding options and politics as narrowing options. That's not a full definition of those words, but it's a useful working definition. Um, people frequently view politics as dirty. Um, there is some reason to believe that in some cases. Without narrowing options, we would have a non-functional society. So we provide the options. We hope that policymakers will run with them. And I'll give you an example of that in a moment. Um, and we talk about the tensions between the different stakeholders. Again, um, I had mentioned we have a publishing unit within EMBO. Um, what the publishers as a stakeholder may need may be different from what the researchers themselves may need. How do we resolve those tensions? Um, we're always talking about trade-offs or compromises and about incremental differences, right? We're not trying to solve everything at once, but we're trying to look at what is the new thing that gene editing, for example, brings that we're trying to deal with. So I want to, in order to frame this, go back to a project I did before I came to EMBO. I was a policy analyst at the J. Craig Venter Institute for about 10 years. Um, I will use the example from synthetic biology and synthetic genomics to try to bring together some thinking on gene editing. But as just came up in that last exchange, synthetic biology by itself is important in how regulators and other policymakers think about biomedical research in general. So I think it will be a useful example. Uh, many of you will recognize this is the cover of the uh, synthesized mycoplasma that was done by Craig Venter and his colleagues at the Craig Venter Institute at the time. I want to use this opportunity to acknowledge the work both on the policy side of the Institute from Robert Friedman and our collaborators, Jerry Epstein, Drew Endy, and Sir Carter, and on the research side, so not only Craig or Dan Gibson, who many people are familiar with from the synthetic cell, but as well Hamilton Smith, Clyde Hutchison, and Carol Lartigue. Um, I worked with that group for about 10 years. I'm going to, in just a few slides, talk about that work, but I, I want to um, assure you that um, this was collaborative and thought through over the course of time. So why do we want a um, minimal cell or a synthetic cell or why do we want to put together a chromosome from scratch, right? And I will just say that one of the, um, the advantages that we all see to gene editing is no one wants to do this, right? What we probably usually want to do is take a chromosome or a genome and change it a little bit. But frequently, in order to change it a little bit, you have to do a lot of work. So there's very practical reasons. Um, but there was also the ideas. I mean, this is sort of what we all talk about in our jobs in terms of the research. Um, we want to know what genes do. We want to use these as launch pads or host cells. We want to make stuff, basically. Um, and again, there are different ways to go about this. but. Uh, Craig and colleagues came through this through the synthetic genomics um, recombinant uh, uh, synthetic biology side rather than recombinant DNA. Why? So again, the scale issue, and this is one of the advantages to genome editing, is you know when you want to make these small things, that's pretty easy. You can make these. When you start getting into big things, these are hard to make. 
um, plants especially, right? So this is always great with policymakers, right? It, it's hard enough to already describe, I want to change this genome for this reason. Um, by the way, these genomes, plant genomes, are particularly weird. So that's what policymakers always want to hear. But they're super interesting genomes. We're not going to synthesize 10 billion nucleotides. Maybe we could, but we probably don't really want to do this. Um, we talk about synthesizing human chromosomes, right? You can get up there, right? We can get close to a million, but this is not going to work. This is the area we were working in at the Venter Institute, somewhere between genes and whole genomes of viruses, and then the mycoplasma that was the model organism, and then the one that was finally synthesized. Um, I'll just note that this came from an original synthesis of the Phyx bacteriophage by uh, Clyde Hutchison and his colleagues. Again, this is around the order of 2,000 nucleotides. Um, you can more or less literally synthesize that genome in your sleep. Um, this is the result of that experiment showing that the synthesized genome was active. Um, by the way, this is Hamilton Smith in the background, uh, Nobel Prize winner at the bench every day. This was not a staged photograph. Um, when you look at this, this is kind of, it's like, great, that really worked. But if you think of this as something other than Phi X, it can get a little scary. I'll talk about that in a second. Here's how you can do this. So this is a a uh, machine that synthesizes short strands of DNA. Um, for my own uh, information, I always like to ask, how many of you have used one of these machines? <coughs> yep, so that, yeah, and me as well. Um, this ship has sailed. This is not really how this is done anymore. Um, these machines, however, are not regulated, and you can have one in your garage, and many people who identify themselves as do-it-yourself Biologists have them in their garage. You can make short things, 75 nucleotides, 100 nucleotides. It's fun, actually. You can also order. So at the time we started this work, Blue Heron was one of the primary companies in providing um, not only oligonucleotides, which most you know, academic campuses have a central facility for, but big pieces, 10,000 nucleotides, maybe 100,000 nucleotides. Um, you can make interesting things with that. You can do it sitting at your desk. Um, that's interesting. It's particularly interesting when you think about how big of a thing you need in order to make something. So you want to make a tRNA. This was the first um, useful bit of nucleic acid that was synthesized by Harka bin Karana and his colleagues. It's a little bit over 100 uh, base pairs for the gene. Um, you know, you can make Phi X. Uh, famously, Eckhard Wimmer made poliovirus, again, here's mycoplasma. I want to bring in a concept that has not come up here at the meeting yet and not irrelevant to gene editing. In the United States, for those of you who have worked there, who will work there, who follow the scientific news there, I cannot overemphasize how important the singular event of September 11, 2001 still influences how policymakers think about the regulation of the use of DNA in laboratories for the purpose of synthesis. Um, this is almost 20 years uh, after the event now. This still happens. It doesn't affect everything, but it is always floating there. If we think about this as a parallel, for example, to gene editing, was the event of the announcement of the birth of the twins in China equal to this? We can have a discussion about that. I don't think so. Um, research wasn't suddenly subjected to new kinds of oversight, particularly under something like the USA Patriot Act, which became relevant for researchers working in other countries. Um, but maybe as uh, researchers in gene editing, you do feel that event had that same impact. I'd be interested to hear about that. Uh, so while this was all going on, again, the work at the Venture Institute continued, and we wanted to look at governance concerns related to synthetic genomics. Um, this is a fairly standard laundry list of concerns for emerging biomedical technologies, um, bioterrorism, harm to the environment, distribution of benefits, um, a bucket frequently called ethical and religious concerns, not because these are automatically lumped together, but because these are things that in a way cannot be solved, but are concerns that we must take into account. Patrick alluded to this toward the end of his talk. 
The work that we did to analyze this ended up in a report, dates from 2007. Um, it's, I'm you know, always on the fence about whether to be happy or sad that it has held up over 12 years. Um, on the one hand, it means the analysis was really good. On the other hand, it means a lot of things have not changed in 12 years. But um, you can judge that for yourself in the report. I'm not going to go through this. This is to point out the analyses that we did to ask what are the steps that could be taken to assure security, um, distrib uh, fair distribution, take into account ethical and religious concerns, while at the same time serving a purpose that policymakers care about. Do we protect the environment? Do we make sure that there's um, no issue in uh, researchers becoming involved in, in terroristic activities. Um, and also, we thought about the administrators, the people who have to themselves worry about this day to day. Um, can, you know, we are concerned about impeding research. We heard this yesterday sometimes, right? The risk is not in doing something, it's doing, in doing nothing. We did not want it to end up that way. For those who are, um, the, some of the frustration in politics is that you do a lot of this work and very little of it seems to be recognized. From our report, we had two almost literally bullet points that went into a guidance to providers of double-stranded DNA. Um, basically, that providers should know who they're distributing a product to and that they should know if this contains a sequence of concern, which is a bit of a term of art, uh, concerning types of DNA that can be distributed in the US, particularly under the Select Agent Act. Um, these seem to be common sense. They were not written anywhere at the time. This is not a law. This is guidance. As Michael said, you don't need a law necessarily. This is an expectation. Um, to go back to the phi -X experiment, if we think about that as smallpox instead of as a bacteriophage, this begins to make a little bit more sense. Um, while these analyses were going on, we were, um, the scientists at the Venture Institute were finishing their full genome of mycoplasma. We simultaneously took on the issue of regulation. So the, particularly the US coordinated framework for biotechnology that Patrick had mentioned. I'm not gonna review this in any detail, but I do wanna pull out that the point that uh, Rishi had brought up about the non-regulation of uh, the plant gene editing in the US, where it is derived from, and this was one of only two concerns we saw in terms of regulation for synthetic genomic products, is because when you, it's a long story, but the short version is when you leave behind bits of DNA from a vector, this can fall under the concept called plant pest. And this is the intersection essentially between process and product. It is true that the US regulates on the product itself, but the process here leaves this behind. So it's one of the rare instances, along with inspection of facilities by the FDA, where it doesn't matter if the product is safe, this is a regulatory hook that automatically brings it in. These are rare. This doesn't happen very much, but this is the legal basis for that. Um, as well, uh, the EPA, under the Toxic Substances Control Act, which is essentially the equivalent of EU's reach, um, had we identified another potential problem which really had to do with resourcing. Um, anything that fell under TSCA um, would be easy, it would be clear what needed to have that regulation. It's just that the scale of what would be coming across their desks was so large compared to what they were accustomed to deal with, um, they would need to hire more people is what it came down to. So what we can get from this are these general policy concerns that I think will apply to gene editing as well. Um, again, we've had the discussion product process, really keep that in mind. Um, we talk about benefits, who benefits from these approaches. We want to mitigate risks. This takes time and effort. Um, again, whether we are looking for a specific outcome or that we want to just take our, and I don't mean the just to be dismissive, it is important to take the technology and see what you can do with it. 
Um, we really like to look at incremental differences. So this is not an exhaustive list, but in any analysis, looking at the differences between biotechnology and any technology or research and application or specific things. So one of the, the analyses we did in the first study was to look at views regarding food versus ornamental plants, ver both sort of public views, but also regulator views. Is there a difference in these? It turns out ornamental plants came up yesterday. People really care about ornamental plants. It's really interesting. And it's unclear you know, what the distinction between those should be if you're looking for regulatory approval. So that was a fun part of that. Um, we can apply these specifically to genome editing. I won't re-review ECJ decision here. Um, again, the human um, editing is, of course, as you know, a special case. That was in the first talk today. It is a special case. But I will say, as we noted with parallel discussions, there is a canon of literature on modification of human beings. It's, we don't really have to rehearse this here. Um, it is bad to do experiments on human beings if you do not know what the outcome is going to be, which makes the experiment difficult, right? There are ways that you resolve this, um, but we have to think about that, and Michael can comment more on that. The difference, of course, with genome editing is that it works, right? This is where it, the idea that you don't have to build these things from scratch come in. CAR-T therapies seem to be working. Um, the modification of human germline, um, whatever your view on that is, um, philosophically or religiously, it, it probably will work at some level. What does that mean, as opposed to something where we're still in the experimental phase? Um, and finally, we can take from these discussions that you know, really, and this came up in the discussion of malaria yesterday, um, the key issue, I think, is that risks and benefits may be flipped depending on, again, where you sit. If you are sitting someplace where malaria is endogenous and you have a community that consents and you have a strong sense of environmental stewardship, that may give you a different view of risks and benefits than, for example, an NGO in Europe would have. We can discuss that. Um, we've already discussed these tools. Part of the reason for being aware of the tools is so that you can work in an area with a level playing field. This is the key to regulation from a policy perspective. We think about level playing field for companies, but it applies to basic researchers, academic researchers as well. We want things to be fair. This is where level playing field comes from. And we always think about you know, whose responsibility are these things. It is a lot to put on particular people, particularly researchers. What, what do these things mean? So we talk about science, right? What we really mean by that is administrators. And administrators have sort of that same valence as regulators, right? It's people that um, maybe you don't want to be spending a lot of time with, but they know enormous um, uh, they have enormous canons of knowledge that they can help you with. But again, scientists ourselves, and again, I identify this way. I come from a biomedical research background. Um, this came up again at the end of Patrick's talk. We're not talking about a moral state here, right? It is what you do because it is the right thing to do. In general, the intent does not matter. So again, the intent in the uh, Chinese modification experiments does not matter if that intent was good or not. It was. Can we allow this in our, or in our um, uh, setting where we have a set of regulations, be they in law or otherwise? So I can finish by sort of noting this slide that was put together a few years ago, um, actually it was 15 years ago now, um, by my late and much missed colleague, Jonathan Tucker. It's basically a cartoon of you know, if we start getting a lot of DNA synthesis happening really fast, at some point we'll be able to use it in um, so dual use concerns, so again, bioterrorism. Um, what he was talking about here was RNA interference. It wasn't about synthetic biology, it wasn't about GMOs, it's about RNA interference. I am assured um, last night that people still use this, they still work on it, it's quite a fruitful area. Nobody is concerned about the dual use implications of this. Why? Because researchers were responsible in what they did with it. And this is true in synthetic biology, and this is true in genome editing. You are all responsible. 
And things have been going pretty well with this, I have to say. I know there's always a lot that comes up around it, but, but I think it's actually going pretty well. And since Patrick started with a reference to a Silomar, I will end with one. So two years after the meeting he referred to, there was another meeting. Um, at the meeting, Patrick referred to, there was in essence a decision to put a moratorium on recombinant DNA research until it could be assured to be safe. At this meeting, there was a vote that allowed the moratorium to be dropped. Um, in the back, you won't be able to see this. This was actually in Rolling Stone magazine in 1975. It was one of only two contemporaneous reports of the meeting. Um, the more important thing here is 140 scientists ask, now that we can rewrite the genetic code, what are we going to say? That was basically all the researchers in the world at the time that could do this kind of work. It was difficult, it was expensive, um, you really needed to be trained. This is not true with the technologies we've been talking about here. So this is what puts the special burden, but which should be taken as a positive challenge on researchers, right, to understand when um, regulators, policymakers, and the public look at what we do. Um, they know that they don't know who you are, but you can show who you are with the work that you do and, um, and clear views as to why. So I will end there. Take questions. <laughs>